Um, this is our uh, grain store at home. Um, it's rather quite important for me that actually um, we're, we're, we're rather sick and tired of steel portal frame buildings. Um, so we decided to tell our story in the centre here is what I inherited off my father as a, as a highly erodible farm. And this is what we're, we, we've created on our own farm um, back in Ross. So um, this is not so unfamiliar as a, as a photograph, unfortunately. Uh, the cost of soil and nutrients to us as farmers is quite, quite amazing that we actually, or most people, treat our soil like dirt. That's a real problem. And as a farmer, what you have to realise is the thing you actually own is soil. You don't own much else. And if you're watching all this soil ending up going down the plug, essentially, that is your money, that is your assets, that is your finance. It's not the healthiest bank balance you're ever going to see. It's a real problem. And as I say, what does a taxpayer get from your benefit? In other words, if I'm getting my subsidies, or as I call them, benefits from you as taxpayers, not quite sure it's really that healthy to start seeing our environment. And for those that know the River Wye, I'm sure you're all more than aware of the phosphate issues and the amount of dead fish and horrific algal blooms we're having. And apparently this is all because apparently we're, we're, we're given subsidies to produce cheap food. One of my greatest questions I ask most farmers are, are you a moron? <laughs> it's also the title of the book I'm writing at the moment. It's really interesting to see, in actual fact, this, it, it, it's become absolutely static, our yields, over the last certainly nearly 30 years. The only thing that's happened is the cost of inputs and the profitability of people that supply those inputs are doing rather quite well. Us as farmers don't seem to be benefiting from all these inputs. More agrochemical, more fertilizer, more veterinary products, and all this beautiful, bright, shiny machinery is all making other people money, and certainly not us. I'm going to touch on one, one product, one product in particular, but nitrogen, and I ask the question, how many plants are deficient in nitrogen in a natural environment? And hopefully you all realise that nothing is deficient, and that's rather quite important. Of course, we had an amazing invention called the Harbour Bosch process that actually took atmospheric nitrogen, uses huge amounts of carbon dioxide to, to, to heat it and then pressurise it in order to form nitrogen or ammonium nitrate. And ammonium nitrate is used for two things. First and foremost, it was used to create huge amounts of bombs. And bombs destroy soil. And it also creates something else, fertilizer, that bombs soil. We also understand that a healthy plant with the correct nutrition will absolutely be far better to resist pest and disease attack. We therefore can remove and reduce fungicide use. So not only is nutrition now reduced, we can reduce fungicides. And as I keep telling people, the knowledge is out there on all of this, the interpretations, the understanding of soil science, the understanding of plant science, what we can do is actually help, or oh, that's what I spend my life doing these days, helping guys get off this horrific moron approach and start understanding that you can change. Farming, is an incredible business model. We take three free things and we make money. Rain, sun, carbon dioxide. Okay, last time I looked they were free. And of course, we have more and more and more CO2. We take those three elements, we put them through our catalyst we make money. And yet it seems that there are more and more people, I could use the term leech, but I'll use the term people, that bolt themselves onto this business model that means that actually this free model does not remain free. 
That's a real problem. And one thing, if nothing else, whenever you look at the agriculture I preach, is to ask yourself, keep asking yourself, does this make sense? Keep taking yourself back to the model that is simply farming. And when we talk about sunlight, in the UK, of course, we do a dreadful, t dreadful um, thing of, of not harvesting the sun's energy. If you've grown a, a winter wheat crop and you've harvested it in July, the solar panels have gone, they're bare soils, they're stubbles, none of, those is, none of that is taking this wonderful amount of energy that's coming to, the, to, to Earth, and we're not using it. As farmers, we basically have solar panels, and that's how we make money. How a healthy soil plant relationship should function. And I think this is, this is rather quite important. I've slightly changed it from last night's. The sun, of course, is rather quite important. As I said, it creates photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is an amazing thing. And we take moisture and we take carbon dioxide. It builds sugars in plants. Up to 80% of those sugars are excreted out of plant roots. That's rather quite important. Why? And this is what it looks like. Huge amounts of carbon-rich amino acids. And why? Because at the end of the day, everybody is a livestock farmer. Most of your livestock's invisible. And what do they feed on? Well, funny enough, they feed on the very thing that the plant is giving them as sugar. And you'd never give these a day off from feeding. So you should never give these a day off either. So it's really quite important that we make and maintain a living root, photosynthesis, pumping into the soil. Because these soil microbes love these and live on root exudates. If they can't get hold of root exudates, they eat the dead plant roots. If they have nothing available to them, they actually eat the organic matter in the soil. So whenever you drive around and you see ploughed fields, and ploughed fields for months and months and months, you can guarantee that the microbes that are in that soil are doing everything they can to survive and eating organic matter, degrading our soil over and over and over again. There's a reason why our soils are so degraded. But back to this, we have these microbes now, and we know we have lots of microbes feeding on these sugars. That's really good. And they, they respire, they're living like us, and they're respiring carbon dioxide. That's rather quite important. The carbon dioxide mixes with all our soil moisture. And it forms a thing called carbonic acid, a very mild acid. Carbonic acid starts stripping away phosphate, potassium, boron, calcium from the soil colloids. And funny enough, when they get stripped away, they become available to your plant. Then we have another thing, the moon. The moon has an amazing impact on our soils if we have a healthy soil. Why? Because I think by now we appreciate that the moon has an effect on our tides. It controls our tides. What does that do? Push and pull water. So what does the moon do to a healthy soil? Well, twice a day, it squeezes our soil moisture up. If you have a compacted layer here, it can't. Then what happens? All our CO2 oozes out of the soil surface. Ever considered why every stomata on every plant on planet Earth is on the underside of a leaf? Stunned silence, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. It's rather, rather amazing. Half a billion years of evolution has, has said, if, if we're going to drive efficiency, why don't we get all the CO2 out of the soil? And why? Because there's six, two, six times as much CO2 coming out of a soil surface, a healthy soil surface, as there is in the atmosphere. If I'm going to drive an efficiency, let's drive it efficiently like that. That makes sense. Then what happens? The moon disappears. 99% of our atmosphere is oxygen and nitrogen. Goes back into our soil. Our soil is breathing. 
And it's really, really important to understand that this is happening. The oxygen, for, for very obvious reasons, are feeding the microbes. 78% of that air that enters that soil is nitrogen. We have billions and billions of microbes converting that nitrogen into plant-available food. And let's be honest, if we've got a fairly unhealthy soil, how much can that root extract? So if we're looking at feeding our plants with all the free products, I want a soil that looks like this, rather than a soil that looks like that. We calculated that this is, is accessing less than 0.3% of soil. This one's up around 11%, which is tiny. As soon as you add fungi around those roots, we're about 52%. Ben, just, you mentioned where those Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. I've got 22 more slides to do, and we've only got 11 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Stop asking questions. Okay. Right, the other thing, the other thing, I wish I hadn't presented this last night. The other thing that's really important is that these photographs were taken within 15 metres of each other. Okay, yeah. This guy's just started a, a soil journey. This guy's been on it for 15 years. And this guy's making two years from there to there. Nature heals really, really quickly if you give it a chance. Checking for soil health. Look at that for an overgrazed, barren green landscape of desertness. <laughs> Smell the soil, it's really quite important. But looking at that soil health, you know, leaf, there's a sun capture. You end up with your photosynthesis, as I said, lots of sugar. Microbes exchange the nutrients to the plant. The nutrient builds a bigger solar panel, i.e., a bigger leaf. Well, funny enough, the whole thing continues and continues. It's an absolute perfect symbiosis. And the picture I've shown here is, if you ever want to look for soil health as an example, take a barren landscape of grass, overgrazed. Dig a hole. You won't find hardly any living thing in it. Go and find a big spear thistle growing in the middle of it. Dig that up and it'll be covered in worms. Huge solar panels, capturing sunlight, feeding biology, creating food for bacteria, for protozoas. Eventually you end up with the protozoas being predated on by worms. It's as easy as that. I, I take it your field there is a set stock field? That was a set stock field of Parkland, yeah. Okay, because after you've done paddock grazing, it would also look like that. It depends how you paddock graze, but I wouldn't paddock graze like that. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how I paddock graze. But no, that's certainly not how you should be paddock grazing. Okay, um, chemistry, physics, biology, parts of soil. We focused for the last 85 years on chemistry and physics. Biology is compl complicated. In actual fact, if we can beat um, and physics and chemistry, I would argue biology is not even a science um, because chemistry and physics and maths are binary. If you do the same experiment over and over again, you expect to see exactly the same results. Biology mutates and it changes. And the reason we've ended up with so many problems is because what we've been doing for that for the last 80 years, because this has the ability to mutate and change, that has now trumped these. We have resistance to antibiotics, we have resistance to pesticides, we have massive problems. It's creating more and more problems. What happens when we actually start focusing on the biology of our soil? It actually drives chemistry and drives the physics. It allows us to actually realize that a biological engine is a far more sustainable thing than the physics and chemical one. And once you have the biology driving, you have chemistry and physics working too. Many people use compost here, active bean composts, aerobics, that's good. We make things called Johnson Sue's for, for, for those that are farmer. Dr. David Johnson of um, University of New Mexico um, developed a very good aerobic static pile compost. We make lots of these. I have um, some of the consultancy I, I do in East Anglia. Uh, they've just made 160 of these. 
on, on, on massive scale. Really quite important. These things are biological breeding grounds. We use our own materials off our own farm. We continue to use it in our own environment or, or, or um, mature it in our own environment. Therefore, we propagate all the microbes that we would find naturally on our farm. If I grabbed a load of these microbes and brought them down here, chances are 70 to 80%, according to research, would die. And that's really quite important. So we can actually put some biology in our soils. We send them off for testing, and as you can see on this test, all totally off the scale, full of biology, all the really good stuff, all great. I'm going to touch on the five principles of soil health. I've probably got to go a little bit quicker, haven't I? <laughs> we need to maintain a living root. It's so important that we do that, wherever, however. We need to limit disturbance wherever possible. And that means mechanical disturbance, but more importantly, and this is what most people fail, is the chemical disturbance. Pesticides, um, veterinary fly sprays, dare I say, worm is even worse. Um, various things chemically are uh, horrific for soils and soil health. Armour, keep the soil covered at all times. You only have to spend your life looking at your driveway or your patio and see Mother Nature spending her life trying to stick little plants up between the cracks. She puts so much effort into armouring herself and all we ever do, seem to do is actually try and spend our lives removing it. Diversity. I'll say the same as I did last night. There's a reason why we didn't all die of COVID. We are all genetically slightly different. When we plant fields and fields and fields of clones, is there any wonder why they break out in disease and have massive problems? And the integration of animals, I don't know how many vegans we've got. I don't, I don't I have any conversation. If you have not got animals integrated into, a, into your ecosystem, it simply doesn't work. This is our farm at home. This is how we, we manage limited disturbance whilst armoring and keeping plant roots and, a, and, um, and photosynthesis is occurring at all times. Direct drilling wheat straight into a living cover crop. And as you can see, requiring very little horsepower, doing a fantastic job. Soil armour, this was taken in August 12th, it was rather hot. Bare soil, 44 degrees. All my soil microbes have died at that temperature. 36 and a half, we've lost 80%. 28 degrees, soil microbes are breeding at their absolute optimum. Diversity. This is the simplest example of diversity I can show. Field of winter wheat. All we've done here is mix 144 varieties, and now we have a clone. This yellowing is called yellow rust. It's had no fungicide applied at all. The yellow rust has pretty much taken out every green part of leaf on the clone. And where we get diversity, funny enough, it stops. It cannot jump from plant to plant to plant. Each single plant of these has an inherent part of disease resistance. <sighs> Integration of livestock. I talk about diversity. We mix all ours. This is called a flood, flock and a herd. <laughs> That's how we manage our livestock all in one great big thing. So we have livestock and they are as diverse as we possibly can. This is the last sheep that we ever visited our farm on TAC. Um, the farmer that actually paid us 50p per head per week decided not only did he want the stubble turnips, he wanted half of my soil. And, and actually, the reason sheep die is they're born to die, not because he's starving them to death. This is our cover crop when we move them off. We've still got armour. We've still got living roots. We've still got everything we're looking for. And we move them over there. And what we're seeing is a net gain. I've got, a, I've got an animal that's grazing and fattening because of this. And I've got soil that is improving because of this. Really quite important. 
And, and somebody asked about um, paddock grazing. Again, this is our paddocks. This is where we've moved them off. You should never be grazing it down to here. The plants stop for at least 21 days. If you can just take 50%, nothing stops growing. So they trample a bit, they defecate a bit, they move on. This is a picture of our, uh, a pond on the farm where we graze the cover crop here. It, there is um, still armor all over it. And, and, uh, and on the right hand side, as you can see, everything drains into this pond. We had 35 millimeters of rain, crystal clear. If that would have been overgrazed on both sides, this would have been full of soil, mud, and who knows what. This is myself and my next door neighbor entering the water course that is the River Wye. That's where I enter the River Wye. That's where my neighbor enters the River Wye. It doesn't take an awful lot to change your practices in order to do that than that. This should be upsetting you as a farmer. It's your asset going literally down the drain. It's a massive problem. I work with various universities, and the University of Cambridge sent me this. In seven years, nitrogen reduction down by 70%, water retention up by 55%, which meant during the drought of this year, funny enough, we, we were able not to feed it lots and lots of horrible salt. Giving any plant salt is the same as giving a human salt when they're thirsty. It makes them more thirsty. Funny enough, we were able to have far better yields than we ever predicted in just seven years of soil building. I didn't go to university and didn't learn. I did go to university, but I didn't go to agricultural university. And therefore, I, I was um, never told, but I'm being told by most people, that it takes about a 1,000 years to create an inch of topsoil. Well, one thing you'd notice on any farm, when you go fencing, you put a brand new fence up. The one thing you do, generally do when you, when you pin a fence is you jam your foot into the bottom of the fence to make sure it doesn't hit the ground then staple it up. And um, that's quite a useful experiment because when you come back 20 years later and the, all the posts have rotted off, you wonder what idiot buried the fence in soil as you're removing it with a telehandler and that sort of thing. And in actual fact, what's actually happened is the building of soil. And that's rather quite quickly. And my idea is, in actual fact, if you don't actually like your soil, you can make a new one. And it's really important that we do, because organic matter and things like that will build rather quite quickly if we allow it to. Come up to Hereford, come and have a look. That was a very whistle-stop tour of soil.